I'm Keep Joel, and this is Comic Smack, your weekly, daily, all the time, anytime comic show where I give you your fix of everything you need to know from the world of comic books and superheroes. And on today's show, we are taking a closer look at the Amazing Spider Man issue number 800, the landmark issue that sees the conclusion of the Red Goblin story arc. What'll happen next? Well, let's hop on in together and find out. Alrighty then, so as we join the comic, Spidey and his currently not so amazing friends are licking their wounds after having Norman Osborn beat the piss out of them in the previous issue. Peter worries that he might not be able to defeat the Red Goblin unless he's willing to do something drastic. Luckily, Flash Thompson gave him the idea to try and use some of the anti-venom material. Our hero better hurry too because now there's a ticking clock going on. You see, at first, Norman Osborn only wanted to kill Peter Parker. Then he wanted to kidnap his grandson to ensure his legacy. Now he's using the kid as leverage to try and gain control of Oscorp, which doesn't exist anymore because it got absorbed by Alchemax, which means he now wants to take over Alchemax. Now, someone who actually ends up kind of having a pretty strong little B-plot in this story is J. Jonah Jameson. He feels bad for spilling the beans about Peter Parker's true identity, and because of that, he takes it upon himself to help Spider-Man in any way he can. And that is by using his journalistic connections to secure Spider-Man some rather unlikely backup, but more on that in a minute. Now, Peter makes his way to Horizon Labs, only to find out that the Red Goblin had beat him there. This leads to a huge fight between the two, wherein Spider-Man just narrowly escapes, and you know what, I'm going to say that a lot because it really does feel like this final extra long issue was just three other issues crammed together. Now the Red Goblin makes good on his threat to hurt Peter's closest friends and family. First up is MJ who thankfully because she's working at Stark Enterprises still actually does manage to defend herself. Unfortunately she ends up turning her security on the wrong symbiote creep. Eddie Brock Venom was sent to protect MJ by Jonah. Oh and FYI this all takes place before the new Venom number one in case you were wondering. When it comes to attacking Aunt May Osborne gets right down in city, ascending little Normie Osborne to do the dirty job himself, the kid having lost himself completely to the Carnage symbiote. Who ends up coming to May's rescue? Well, you'll never believe it, the superior octopus, yeah, Doc Ock, who is still dealing with all the memories of his time as Peter Parker, decides to actually help out this woman who never hurt a soul. Hey, hey, remember the time Dr. Octopus tried to marry Aunt May because he was gonna get a nuclear power plant out of the deal? Uh, comics are fun. Now, Spider-Man and Venom join forces to try and take down the Red Goblin, but even their united front isn't enough to fight him. He's too unpredictable, and all the old symbiote tricks don't work anymore. This time, it's the Red Goblin who ends up running away and making a tactical retreat, but Eddie Brock, who shockingly seems to be a good guy in this issue, figures to himself that, you know what, if they're gonna beat this guy, Pete needs a big boost in power, so he offers the Venom symbiote to him again. Now that he's fully back in black and ready to attack, Spider-Man rushes to save his aunt, only, hey, you know what, everyone's coming out of the woodwork to save May because Jonah's there once again trying to make amends in an old Spider Slayer suit. Hey, hey, hey Jonah, remember, remember how the Spider Slayer Smythe killed your wife? <laughs> Comics are not funny sometimes. The Goblin Child ends up running away from the fight. Peter's pretty surprised to see that Doc Ock, despite the last time they met each other and the fact that he's still wearing his Hydra Nazi aligned suit, was actually willing to die for his aunt, opts to give Otto a blank slate before we head on over to the next part of the story. Red Goblin and his hostage slash sidekick go to Alchemex to sign over all the paperwork and make it official. At first, it looks like Liz Allen is more than willing to do what Osborne asks, but this is actually part of a much bigger trap wherein Harry Osborne comes riding in on his own freaking goblin glider to save his kid. Man, you know, it just hits me everyone else is having cooler moments in this story than Spider-Man. An enraged Red Goblin tries to even the score by throwing Liz Allen out a window. Norman even opines to himself, what is it with him and throwing blonde women off tall things? Spider-Man with his black suit is able to save Liz. This is more than enough proof to Normie that his grandpa is absolutely evil and he turns on him. Man alive, was that a quick heel face turn in just two issues to borrow a wrestling term? Spider-Man and the Goblin both end up retreating this time on a chase that takes them further and further into the city. Red Goblin says that his greatest ploy is still yet to be played. That for every person that he had a fight with over the last couple issues, he poisoned them with small pieces of the Carnage symbiote, and when he snaps his fingers like Thanos, he can kill them all. Only he can't actually do this because Flash Thompson, Agent Anti-Venom, proves to be the true MVP of this entire storyline because he caught wind of this plan and managed to save everyone from the small Carnage shards. Norman, once again enraged that his plan is falling apart, decides to kill Flash Thompson in retribution. Oop, guess that means we're not going to be getting an Agent Anti-Venom miniseries after all then, huh? 
Red Goblin, knowing now that he can't kill the people he actually wanted to kill, he decides that the best way to hurt Spider-Man is to just start killing people randomly in Times Square. I mean, it's arguably his most consistent scheme he's had so far. Spider-Man disagrees, the two fight it out, Red Goblin gets the upper hand on him. Peter Parker proves that he actually knows his enemy better than anyone else by playing up to Osborn's ego, saying that if he kills him now in the guise of the Red Goblin, he really won't be succeeding in killing his greatest enemy. It will be Carnage and Lead is Cassidy who get all the credit. Both Spider-Man and Green Goblin decide to jettison their symbiote partners and duke it out one-on-one -on -one like they always have. Spider-Man actually starts to win now that it's a fair fight. Osborn tries to cheat by joining back up with the Carnage symbiote, but because they're temporarily split from one another, their old weaknesses return. Spider-Man fries the Carnage symbiote halfway into fusing with Osborn, which means his brain gets fried in the process and he ends up a gibbering maniac thinking that he's Cletus Cassidy. J. Jonah James Jameson shows up with a gun and we restage a really awesome moment from the Ultimate Spider-Man universe where you think Jameson is going to finally kill Norman Osborn and get it over with, but Spider-Man takes a bullet for the bad guy because, hey, with great power comes great responsibility and all that jazz. This is basically where the story ends, but we get treated to a series of epilogues. We get Flash Thompson's funeral, where Peter Parker talks out what a complicated relationship they had, but how despite all of it, at the end of the day, Flash was truly his hero. Jonah and Pete reconcile, Jameson finally admitting that Spider-Man is good for the city and that they do need him. The Osborne kid still has his piece of the Carnage symbiote and is going to have to be living with that moving forward. Ooh, uh, Dr. Octopus gets a new job at Horizon Labs, which means he'll be close to the woman he loves and he gets a new spider costume. Whew, and believe it or not, that's actually where Amazing Spider-Man issue number 800 ends, everybody. Overall, it was better than I thought it was, but not as good as I wanted it to be. I get the distinct feeling Dan Slott wrote his final words on Peter Parker a long time ago, and with nothing new to say or to add, he decided to, you know, give everyone else the last goodbye. Which, you know, works. Jameson has a really solid arc, even if Chip Zdarsky has been doing more with Jameson recently. Seeing Spider-Man actually learn to be okay with the Venom symbiote and forgive it and Dr. Octopus for all the bad things that they've done and actually, you know, acknowledge their character growth felt nice. Flash Thompson finally gets his due as a hero, it, but he only gets it in death, further proving what I've always felt, and that is that Marvel never really knew what to do with him, despite the fact that he's been great for so long. Red Goblin was a really cool idea with a really cool design, but his motivations and plot were so all over the damn place, it was really hard to care about him. Overall, though, I would give it a 6.5 out of 10, an adequate ending for the amazing Spider-Man. So that was Spider-Man 800, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, be sure to take a closer look at some of these other videos. I've been working on, then you can follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Cape Joel so you're always up to speed on what I'm doing next. And hey, if you like what I do and are feeling in supportive mood, please check out my Patreon link down in the description. Patrons get exclusive access to videos and content before anyone else, and you can do so for as little as a dollar a month. So until next time, everyone, this has been Cape Joel. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again next time. Bye bye.